eyesight is so important and and we definitely you know if if you're getting vision changes if you're seeing spots in your vision or you can't see that's an obviously telltale sign something's wrong and you should go get it checked but a lot of times your eye disease is your body has learned to hold on to have prioritized good vision and then it lets go of that at, at the worst moment like it holds on to keep it keep it good keep it good and then if there is a disease process then things get affected and it's always way late uh so there are many not just eye diseases, but systemic diseases, autoimmune conditions that affect our eyes and brew, can brew for years before you have vision loss. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. Today, we're going to dive into the topic of eye health and dry eyes in particular as we connect with Dr. Joseph J. Allen. He's an accomplished optometrist who really understands what it takes to educate the public about eye health. He graduated magna cum laude and salutarian from this Rosenberg School of Optometry back in 2015 and completed his residency in the Minneapolis VA Medical Center. Dr. Allen is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry. He was awarded the Media Advocacy Award from the American Optometric Association in 2021. Now, as a practicing optometrist in Minnesota and founder of Dr. Eye Health, an educational YouTube channel with more than 850,000 subscribers, he gets what it takes to distill really important technical information into terms that you and I can understand. Dr. Allen has been featured in Ask Men and Oprah Daily and so many more avenues, including, of course, his YouTube show. Dr. Mm -hmm. Allen, welcome to the show. Hello, and thank you, Karina. This is, um, again, a huge honor for me, and, and just uh, thank you for the intro. That's very nice. <laughs> well, if I can just say optometric correctly once or twice during this, I'll be impressed with myself because ophthalmology, optometry, mm -hmm. all of these things, they're difficult to say words. I, I need more omegas, obviously. Right. right. O's, T's, H's in random places. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Now, I have to say, I'm I'm really impressed with the content that you create on YouTube. And in fact, that's what inspired me to reach out to your team in the first place um, and specifically share your knowledge with our audience as it relates to eye health and dry eyes in particular. I mean, your, your personal story is so well told on that YouTube clip. So I'll be sure to include links to that particular episode where you cover testing your results of omega-3s and all of that jazz with our show notes. But I wanted to discuss first what actually brought you to this profession and then inspired you to create this YouTube channel. Uh, first of all, thank you again. Um, I put a lot of work into that specific video that you're, you're referencing um, and, and a few other videos as I've kind of dived more into the research and trying to have better answers around nutrition and eye health and, and specifically around dry eyes, which is something I've personally battled with and I see a lot of patients for. As far as why I got into the world of eye care, I think from a young age, I was always fascinated with eyes and how we see the world and how we interpret reality through our eyesight. And then, of course, as a young lad of like seven, eight years old, I got glasses and I had thick glasses till I was about seventh grade when I got contact lenses. And that changed my life in many ways um, where I was able to play sports easier. Uh, I had was able to make friends easier because I was playing sports and then girls started paying attention to me. And at the age of 13, that's like the world. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had a huge life transformation because of switching into contact. So, you know, I'd see my dentist didn't like how my feet, how, how they poked and prodded at my teeth. But I'd see my eye doctor and I was like, this guy's awesome. Like everything's like black magic. I see better afterward. And then I just loved contacts. Uh, and so kind of with that inspiration, as I moved forward through schooling, I was like, you know, what could I do? What could I see myself doing? I like science. 
I asked my eye doctor at that time, like, what is life like for you? Mm. And uh, that sort of persuaded me, okay, I'll set that as a North Star. You know, who knows what college is going to bring if maybe I'll find something else. But that's a North Star for me to kind of walk that path. Um, and then <laughs> just my passion for it continued to roll and roll and roll. And, and that's kind of uh, how I ended up practicing as I, I do today. Uh, and then as far as the YouTube channel, I finished my residency in 2016 and started practicing. And in private practice, I, I worked at a few different clinics at the time, just kind of filling in throughout the week. And I, I was always kind of frustrated that I didn't have enough time with my patients. I wanted mm -hmm. to explain what glaucoma was. I wanted to explain how diabetes is going to affect their eyes and why they, like these are the lifestyles, this is what the research shows that they can do to change uh, their life and reduce their risk of these diseases. But unfortunately, because of the economics and insurance and reimbursements and, and everything, it's like, I, I think almost everybody goes to see their doctor probably is frustrated that they only have a few minutes with their doctor. They can only ask one or two questions. And then they're kind of shuffled off to the, the, the doctor's got to get to the next patient. Yep. And I realized around that time of my frustration and wanting to teach people and realizing that everybody's going to Dr. Google you know, I, I, even I do it. I'm like curious what's going on. I'm, I'm going to look, I'm going to see what's posted online. And in the YouTube space where I had personally always, since I was in high school, watched a lot of YouTube, learned a lot from YouTube. There just wasn't much on eye care uh, or what was on there was from maybe like a 14 year old kid talking about <laughs> their contacts. Uh, and it wasn't coming from anybody who was in the profession or practiced in the profession. And so I was like, okay, I need a hobby <laughs> and I love to teach. Let's figure it out. Let's, let's. But this isn't your only hobby either. And I mean, I know as a somebody who creates a fair amount of content through podcasting, it takes a lot of time and effort to prep for those things, to video them, to edit mm -hmm. them together and to bring them out into the world. So how do you strike this balance between your profession for optometry, right? Actually seeing your patients, the YouTube channel, and then your personal life. I mean, you have all these outdoor interests. You like to cook. You even like to video game. How do you even make time for them? <laughs> um, you know, the sad truth is the last few years were really tough. And I had a, I had a challenge for the first three to four years of, of, the, of doing the YouTube channel of working like five, six days a week mm -hmm. and doing the YouTube channel at the same time. So uh, I even had points where uh, I, I'll admit I was working to an unhealthy amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had patients even ask like, are you okay? You look <laughs> ill, you look pale. And, and I sacrificed a lot just to work hard and, and, and kind of fuel that passion. But I did have to sacrifice a lot. Uh, and thankfully in the last few years, I was given an opportunity where it's like, look, I can choose to make less money, you know, see less patients in the clinic, but I had more time and a better balance in life to invest my creativity and to really, well, I see the YouTube channel is not, I see it more as public health. Like I, I'm offering public education to help people of the world learn about their eyes, what they can do, what they should ask their doctor. Uh, and that's, that's hitting a different level of of satisfaction more so than just working to make to make income but i like seeing patients i love seeing patients in the clinic and so i've struck this balance of working a few days a week in the clinic and then the rest of the week kind of working on the rest of these projects around public education whether it be youtube or, or podcasting or or teaching other doctors I, I give a lot of lectures to other doctors based on uh, research and um, clinical uh, I'm an adjunct clinical professor for a couple of schools of optometry. So I teach a lot of students too, but oh, that's thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> so just acknowledging the work that goes into it. Now, I also understand that in this particular video, you were inspired to test your before and after omega-3 levels and really talk about your journey with dry eye. A lot of people suffer from dry eye. And your personal experience with that particular story, I think is quite interesting. So I'd like to invite you to just talk about the process overall as Orlo is also conducting a before and after tested by you campaign, where we're actually providing 
the Omega Quant Test Kit too. So I think you telling your personal story will help our audience understand, you know, how easy this is and what they can expect to learn from the process. So the my my experience with uh, Omega threes. There's a lot, so much research, right? Omega threes has been in the research since like what the like the 1960s or something mm -hmm. like that. It's it goes back pretty far. In the realm of dry eye, it really started coming out in the early 2000s as like, hey, this might be a treatment for dry eye disease. The challenge uh, as a clinician, and I find many eye doctors, um, both optometrists and ophthalmologists, your eye surgeons, they've looked at this research and they've always kind of stood on the fence because some research, uh, right, there's so many different types of dry eye, like dry eye is multifactorial disease. And a lot of the research, there's how many milligrams did that one study use? Very little. Well, this other study used a lot, but then there's what type of omega-3 and what type of metrics did they follow to really say what, what improved and what didn't in the terms of how much tear volume or was it damage to the ocular surface or was it evaporation rate uh, or was it just patient satisfaction? There, there's so many different metrics and it, it honestly is all over the place. But the, the vast majority of studies looked at for dry eye do largely conclude that there is likely some benefit. Even a Cochrane review in 2019 did say that there's likely some benefit of taking omega-3s in the realm of dry eye. Uh, although they even said that, yeah, there's just a lot of mixed data and uncertainty. Or the AREDS 1 and 2 studies, which focused on a com combination of ingredients, including omega-3s to support eye health. But, you know, I think Bosch and Lom even came out with a product um, that was marketed in Walgreens and drugstores, which is a combination of ingredients, I believe, including some eye health specific antioxidants like lutein or zeaxanthin, mm -hmm. something to that effect. But, you know, again, it's a lot of anecdotal evidence of people saying, I take my omega-3s and my dry eye complaints subsided. Uh, many people who live in the state of Arizona, as a, for example, just because it's so dry there, will, will have evaporative issues in dry eyes. Just the, the whole region can experience that. Some people experience dry eye when they work in air conditioned buildings exclusively. So by the end of the day, it's like both eye fatigue from staring at bright screens and also exposure to dry air. So, you know, again, like you said, multifactorial, yeah. but even just walking through the experience for you, I mean, that YouTube video, which is only about 12 minutes, you edited it like really well, I think, um, shared even the additional things that you were doing to help manage your dry eye right. as a contact wearer and also as somebody who might have some glandular potential issues mm -hmm. within the eye to like make sure you're, you've got the right lubrication of your eye, right? right. So what have you found both through your per personal experience taking the omega-3 during that test and, and beyond that since it's now been, I think, a couple months since you concluded? Yeah, so... With the whole video, I really wanted to take not just a personal look at how I would do uh, taking omega-3s, because I'd taken them in the past, but never consistently, and mm -hmm. I never did it in a, like a scientific matter. I never really tracked my symptoms. I never tracked my blood levels, and that's something that almost no studies really have done in the realm of dry eye and omega-3. They've, they've, the few have, but they, most of them have not tracked the omega-3 before and after. Uh, so I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to feel good about it as a personal level, but also from a clinical level as a, a as a clinician in the clinic, am I going to recommend this to my patients? I wanted to kind of see how I did with it because I've struggled with dry eyes, as, as you've said, and I've mentioned in the video since I was a teenager with contact lenses. And then as I've gone through schooling, learning about the meibomian glands, which are the oil glands in your eyelids those oils prevent your tears from evaporating. And for a lot of people, these glands start to atrophy, diminish for many different reasons. But uh, it's something I struggled with. So in the, in the video, as I outlined, uh, I started first off seeing my blood levels of omega-3s, which were quite alarming to me because uh, I wasn't taking any omega-3 supplements. And I personally have eaten more of a plant-based diet for about the last seven going on eight years now. Yeah. And for anybody who's followed other um, researchers or other uh, doctors in that space that kind of 
advocate for a plant-based diet. A lot of people say, oh, well, if you eat enough um, flaxseed, ground flaxseed, or, or other just vegetable sources of omega-3s that you, your body will convert enough. And I've always been frustrated because they're just, I, I try to find the research to back up those statements and I sometimes can't find it uh, or the little bit I find are pretty old and I just don't find them like the best answers. So I was interested in doing that blood test to see where was I at? And unfortunately I was around a 4.5, 4.6 or maybe honestly, a little bit less, 4.3. Honestly, that's pretty good for a vegan. And so? <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but most vegans actually test at about three and a half percent. Um, because again, that same issue where you, you know, you could consume a lot of flax oil, you could consume a lot of walnuts, you can consume a lot of chia seeds and your body just doesn't metabolically make those plant sourced omega threes into EPA and DHA easily. It takes about 16 times more fat to get there, but that's um, assuming that your system is operating optimally. And the reasons it might not operate optimally are if you don't have the right nutrient balance, including B vitamins, vitamin C, and some others. Um, if you actually are consuming omega-6s at the same time, and all of those plant sources also have omega-6s in them, and the same enzymes are used to break it down from the plant source linoleic acid into arachidonic acid, as you would see on the omega-3 side from alpha linoleic acid to EPA and DHA. So the balance that becomes very hard it's hard to get enough omega-3 if you're only consuming plants. Thankfully, you can take an algae oil. And so that's where Orlo comes in. We can talk more about that. But I, I just think it's actually not entirely surprising that you'd be around 4%. Um, taking a supplement, though, you can expect to be 6% and higher, even if you're just consuming plant sources, as long as you're getting the EPA and DHA directly. And so I just want to make that comment here. So if somebody is plant-based and they're listening to this, you don't necessarily need to run to fish oil. In fact, fish get their omega-3s, EPA, and DHA from the algae they consume. So that's there. Four and a half percent, not terrible, but not great because Omega Quant even says what the ideal is to be 8% plus. Mm -hmm. And yeah. thank you for sharing that. So that was my, my initial kind of motivation for doing this this specific video and doing my own research on this. And I knew algae oil uh, was available and was something I wanted to try, but most of the research on dry eye specifically is using fish, uh, the fish oil supplements. And the, um, the vast majority of eye doctors I know still uh, maybe don't recommend the algae. There's just not that much research on algae oil specifically for dry eye. So, um, so maybe that'll be a part two. <laughs> my <laughs> yeah. next my part two video will be me switching to algae. But the for this video, yeah, I switched to, um, I did fish oil. I was, I tried to be as adherent to the plan as possible. And I think maybe I missed a few days throughout it, uh, throughout the three month trial, but I did it every day. I tracked my dry eye symptoms uh, through a, a dry eye questionnaire every single day. I measured the oil levels of my tear film. I measured um, a couple of other parameters, but then tracked those uh, over the three month period and then did another omega quant blood level test uh, and found thankfully my omegas was around nine, about nine and a half. So a pretty Im significant improvement, but then also my symptoms improved and my oil production of my tear film improved. And, um, my oil, I, I was very subjectively, but I have a little mirror I would use at home to track if any of my oil glands were getting clogged. Because oftentimes I, in the past, I'd been able to just look in the mirror and I could see some of my glands were clogged. And throughout this period, after maybe that six to eight week mark of taking the supplements, my glands were not clogging. So at least I'm, I'm only an N of one, right? I'm only one person. But uh, by doing this and noticing such an improvement in my own symptoms and, and with having objective data from the clinic, and knowing that I was getting this improvement in my blood levels, uh, I felt way more confident in, in recommending them to my patients. But I do now uh, recommend for my patients to consider doing a blood test first so they know where they are at before they even start, or if they're currently taking some other brand or form of, of omega-3 to test where they're at because perhaps they're not getting enough or perhaps it's not a, the best quality or most efficient form for them. 
so that's that's kind of what I've I've learned from from doing that that study and self study and video. Yeah, well, and otherwise you had a healthy diet starting out. You just weren't consuming fish, right? <laughs> and you weren't consuming other animal sources of omega threes either. So it just made it tough to get enough. So I, I totally get that. Now I want to take a moment to talk about what Orlo is doing, just so everyone is aware. Um, this podcast is actually brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. It's the most sustainable and bioavailable algae-based nutrition products in the world. Orlo makes omega-3s in their best absorbed polar lipid form and from pure sustainable algae. It's grown at their state-of-the-art facility in Iceland with only beautiful, pristine Icelandic water and the nutrients that algae need to thrive. Now, all green energy, so closed system, you can expect the algae to grow exponentially and become something that can continue to supply us for years to come. Their omega-3s provide EPA and DHA in their direct form and at up to three times better absorption than fish oil. This means it's not only better for you, it's better for the planet and without that fishy aftertaste. Now, Orlo is standing behind their product in a whole new way now with the Tested by You program. They provide before and after Omega Quant test kits to verify your Omega-3 levels today and another test after your fourth month of supplementation. To get this offer, all you need to do is visit Tested by You product page on orlonutrition.com and subscribe. You'll get their everyday unbeatable price of 15% off plus two Omega-3 index tests to tests. And these are valued at $100, $50 a piece within your first six months of subscription. So to get this deal, just go to orlonutrition.com and visit the Tested by You product page. And don't forget to use the coupon code NWC for a bonus discount at checkout. Now, I want to talk about what other benefits you realize specifically during this um, test that you performed, taking a high dose of omega-3s. Um, just if you noticed anything else beyond the dry eyes, because I think often people assume, oh, I'll take a supplement, I'll take it every day, and I don't really feel a difference, so I'm going to stop. But that's not always the case with omegas. As you said, your dry eye symptoms abated. Um, but did you notice anything else? You know, um, one of the bigger ones, and I don't know if, if this is truly just anecdotal or not, but I know my skin has been better. And I've had mm. other people comment that my skin, that I just looked better. But beyond that, um, you know, I haven't really noticed too many other issues. Uh, perhaps my, I, I've had a history of gut issues, which is mainly one of the reasons why I even switched to eating more of a plant-based diet, because I, I found it helped a lot with my own GI problems. Um and, and it could be just that I've been eating a lot healthier in the last uh, six months, maybe since since I started that trial, because I started back in like uh, end of December of 2022. Um, but perhaps the omega threes have had a benefit there, too. But yeah, well, what I noticed personally, um, I notice more if I forget to take them, if, you know, for a few days, I'm like, gosh, why I'm, I'm feeling a little foggy, like brain fog, you mm -hmm. know? something like that. But um, my personal story in omega-3s is also connected to eye health. Um, I had terrible vision starting when I was just a little kid. Like people would point to the stars and tell me that they saw a blue star, a red star, whatever, and I, I would never be able to see them. And so it was, I was found out in third grade when um, we had a spot optometrist come in and check our vision. Um, and I had been hiding it from everybody, like sitting in the front of the class, copying notes from somebody next to me, because I didn't want to wear glasses. And, um, you know, ultimately had to wear glasses, could see the spots in the moon for the first time and all of that jazz. Now, in my 20s, I started supplementing with omega threes and a lot of them, I was working in the omega three industry. And I started to get eye strain headaches or what I thought were eye strain headaches. Mm. I went to the optometrist to try and figure out what was going on with my vision. And they told me that my vision had improved by two steps. So going from a negative 6.5 to a negative six, just in both my right and left eye, nearsighted, right? And then over the course of the next three years, my vision actually improved about every six months. I'd have to go in for a new prescription that was less. By the time it leveled out, I was 28 and I decided to get LASIK. 
Now, LASIK eye surgery, when you have this done, you know, I didn't want to wear glasses anymore. I love to do outdoor sports. I'm a scuba diver. I'm a horseback rider. And being really active is a lot of, a lot of fun for me, right? And so I went ahead and had the LASIK, understanding full well that this could create dry eye complaints. I was religious about using the rewetting drops, but I also continued to take a lot of omega-3 through my healing phase. I've never had dry eye complaints. Not once. I don't actually notice any of the scars on my eyes from having the LASIK or anything like that. Um, and so, frankly, I'm like the best case scenario, I think, for this. My, my vision went from being a negative 5.25 to a, I have 2020 and 2015 vision and one eye and the left. Now, my eye doctor also shared with me at the time I decided to get LASIK that while my focal point was right in front of my face, I would probably always see perfectly to be able to read before the surgery. But now I'm like everyone else and expected my vision to start to falter in my 40s. I'm 46 now. I still don't need reading glasses. When should I start to reach for my reading glasses? I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, well, I don't know exactly what your your powers of your eyes are at, but uh, generally, for the vast majority of people, they will sometime in their between their 40s and 50s, they'll usually start to have some challenge seeing up close. But mm -hmm. that also depends on your pupil size a little bit. And again, what your refractive uh, error is. But if somebody was perfectly Plano needing no glasses at all, they were powers were zero. Uh, generally around that mid forties to late forties, uh, they're going to be more dependent on some form of magnification to see up close. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm hoping it doesn't happen anytime soon. I do still have a mild astigmatism, but it doesn't affect my vision to the point where I need glasses. So. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The, there is a lot to be said about omega threes, especially the DHA component, uh, and its relationship to both brain or the neuro health and your retinal health because your retina really is an extension of the brain and so there is a quite a bit of research i'm sure as you know into uh omega-3s whether it be from a diet source or supplementation and its effect on several different eye diseases uh as far as uh changing your uh, your demand for glasses or nearsightedness uh, there might have been other factors. Again, we don't have that data. Yeah, I don't either, have... but it's just really surprising. Like, um, yeah. you know, I, I hadn't heard of somebody's vision getting dramatically better in their 20s, like literally from 25 to 28, three years. Yeah. I had to get a new lesser prescription each six months. I'm, I'm, I can make my own speculations of what probably happened, <laughs> <laughs> which are probably more on the sides that you were either over minus during previous years. You were given way too much power. Uh, mm -hmm. or your eyes had been uh, almost over accommodating uh, and your eyes were almost getting fixated uh, to focus on something up close. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were having a hard time letting that muscle tension go. Uh, a lot more research is going into myopia and nearsightedness. And now we have new devices to measure axial length or the length of the eyeball and how that changes. And then now, <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much. <laughs> but there's so much. Uh, no matter what though, omega-3 is has been shown in, in many, many studies to play an important role in retinal health, whether that be for macular generation, diabetes, um, uh, and then just overall aging of the eye in both animal and human studies. So, yeah. Well, if we understand too, that half of the fat in the brain and eyes is made up of DHA, it really mm -hmm. becomes no wonder, right? Like you need to supply this fat to your body to have health. Wow. Yeah, I think it's uh, the photoreceptor cells in the back of the eye, which give you your eyesight. If you lose your photoreceptor cells, you, you can't see. Uh, about 50 to 60% of those photoreceptor cells are made of DHA. And wow. that's one of the reasons why young kids, um, like prenatal and in, young infants, are, are um, they need to get DHA to, to form their retina and cr even have the chance of seeing good vision. So there's, it's quite fascinating. Um, and like you mentioned before, the AREDS vitamin studies, which is more for macular degeneration and not specifically dry eye, but they did do some studies looking at omega-3 supplementation. But uh, that, that specific study didn't conclude that there was any real benefit to reducing the advancement of macular degeneration in, in that study group. 
Um, but that comes to debate. Was it because they didn't have enough omega-3? Was it the form of omega-3? There's so many questions to that. And hopefully more research will tell. Now, I have a question specific to optometry and its role in overall health. Because mm -hmm. I think often people assume that if they don't have poor vision, they don't need to go to an optometrist. Even when their insurance often covers optom optometry for a relatively simple or minor fee. So I've learned over the years that optometrists can actually help people discover disease states before they are advanced enough to be discovered by your GP. So mm -hmm. talk to us about this. Why, why is it important to get an annual from an optometrist? This is one of my favorite kind of questions and favorite things about my profession uh, is that, yes, eyesight is so important. And, and we definitely, you know, if, if you're getting vision changes, if you're seeing spots in your vision or you can't see, that's an obviously telltale sign something's wrong and you should go get it checked. But a lot of times your, your eye disease is your body has learned to hold on to have prioritized good vision. And then it lets go of that at the worst moment, like it holds on to keep it, keep it good, keep it good. And then if there is a disease process, then things get affected. It's always way late. Uh, so there are many, not just eye diseases, but systemic diseases, autoimmune conditions that affect our eyes and brew can brew for years before you have vision loss. And so thankfully during an eye exam, we can see through the cornea, the front surface of the eye, we can see through the pupil, the dark circle, you know, the center part of the, the iris. Uh, we can see through that and using light, we can see the retinal tissue in the back. And that means we can see your blood vessels. We can see your optic nerve, the direct nerve connecting to your brain. And this, all of these tissues will tell us if there is bleeding from saying something like diabetes if there's high blood pressure issues from chronic blood pressure causing constriction of your blood vessels, we can see bleeding in the eye from if you have anemia. Uh, we can see autoimmune conditions uh, such as any sort of inflammatory. Funny enough, inflammatory bowel disease affects the eye. There's there's an interesting whole subsection of retinal research uh, called the gut retinal axis. Uh, and so a lot is going into that, especially around the microbiome becoming such a big uh, research topic. And then also brain diseases, certainly things like multiple sclerosis. Um, unfortunately, brain tumors do happen. And uh, even tumors of the eyeball itself will be able to catch these uh, just through a simple eye exam. Even if you don't need glasses, doctors are happy to see you just so that they can look and examine and make sure everything is working well and working the way they should. Now, I, I understand. I think there's also an ability to see early signs of diabetes. Is that not so? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, we catch uh, just the other week. <laughs> I had a patient who uh, had, you know, they didn't see their family doctor very often, but uh, just by looking in the eye, there's some telltale signs of how diabetes causes damage and we'll catch it before um, even their family doctor will. Are there any myths that you'd like to help debunk specific to eye health? Hmm. There are a lot of, <laughs> there, there, unfortunately, there are a lot of, lot of myths. Uh, probably the biggest one is that, oh, I see fine. I don't need to see the eye doctor. That's probably mm. the biggest myth yeah. uh, by far. Uh, I know there's a lot of confusion about blue light in, in the world right now. Um, <laughs> I think that really blew up during 2020 as everyone was staring in front of computer screens and getting eye strain and, and probably worse dryness because they weren't blinking enough in front of the computer. Uh, there is certainly some good scientific evidence that blue light influences our uh, sleep patterns as well as some role in our metabolism. But the research is still very early uh, and there may be role of, of having some awareness to how much blue light you are absorbing. Um, but again, more research is coming. <laughs> trying to think if there's other big kind of myths. Uh, I'll think about it if something comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> So just as we, we talk about some of these things now, good sleep hygiene, I think also involves shutting off your devices a bit before you go to sleep. Um, are you seeing a connection between blue light exposure and sleep? Or is that something that you've read up on? Yeah. Uh, so again, there is a, a specific receptor in your retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. I know that's a, that's a fun one. Uh, but this doesn't even communicate eyesight to your brain. This cell, and it only counts about 1% of your retina, it is highly sensitive to blue light. 
and it communicates to the parts of your brain which regulate your sleep cycle, your alertness, and even your pupil size. And so they, they do know and have been able to show that blue light in both animal and human studies does affect our melatonin, your, your sleep hormone. It affects how much you release and at what time it releases. So uh, although I think a lot of people do try to unwind in the evening by looking at their phone, watching a show on, on YouTube or, or responding to comments or emails, it is a good practice to learn to calm down, shut things away, um, maybe read a book <laughs> or, or talk with a family member, um, try meditation or something, something a little bit less stimulating. Do the blue light shields that operate as apps on your phone really do anything? There are some publications that have shown that that does have some beneficial effect of reducing the blue light impact on your sleep cycle. Uh, it's not 100%, but I know there's, again, even computer and cell phone uh, manufacturers are looking into researching new ways to eliminate this level of harsh light. And so um, right now it may have some effect for you. And it's mm -hmm. probably better than nothing, <laughs> but... Yeah. yeah. Again, more research is always needed. Right. I thought of so, one more myth. Oh, yes. Good. Sure. Carrots. Oh. Carrots are, um, you know, mainly a, everyone thinks carrots are good for the eyes, right? Uh, and certainly there is a benefit because carrots help us form vitamin A. Carrots have the form of beta carotene. Uh, and then you form that in your liver and vitamin A is used in your retina to help you see. Uh, however, as more research has come out, uh, lutein, which you get in green leafy vegetables, may have an even better protective effect uh, alongside probably DHA and omega-3s as being more supportive for eye health because you get vitamin A in so many sources through our diet, more than just carrots. Uh, it's probably not as essential unless you are um, calorie deficient um, as in malnourished countries and, and places around the world. Yeah, that's how vitamin angels got their start. They were um, specifically giving just vitamin A soft gels to mm -hmm. women um, during pregnancy and post-pregnancy in countries around the globe because children were being born and never developing the ability to see because yeah. they literally had too little vitamin A in their diet, surviving on things like potatoes, which have no vitamin A in them. And so, um, yes, eating a variety of green leafy vegetables, eat the rainbow, as they say, or if you're watching mm -hmm. this on YouTube, you see the, the plate that I have in the background, which is just some arugula and shaved radish and tomatoes. That alone would have some lutein in it, as well as probably some astaxanthin, zeaxanthin. And so these are antioxidants that are present in fruits and vegetables. You can mm -hmm. get them supplementarily as well. And I understand that lutein is the antioxidant that's specific to the cornea. Is that correct? Or is um, it the macula. Uh, the or, macula. Uh, yeah. So it's actually resident in there and helps to filter the blue light, right? Exactly. It's yeah. kind of like the bullseye. If you and I were at, at, at a pub and throwing darts uh, at, the, at the bullseye, um, if you were to look at the retina in the back of the eye, the central bullseye where you see your 20-20 vision, your good vision, your color vision, your ability to read and, and recognize your loved one's faces, that part of the eye is called the macula. And the vast majority of lutein, zeaxanthine are all, all stored right in that central spot. And it's to basically protect against harsh, uh, harsh light, oxidative damage, filter the high energy blue light. It's like a natural blue light filter, as is often said. Um, and most people are very deficient, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and especially children, because they don't, you know, kids usually hate to eat their vegetables. Uh, mm. But yeah, you you mainly get lutein from from vegetable sources, uh, green leafy vegetables, that sort of thing. A few nuts yeah. too, but. Yeah, not, the, not the supplements on the market are mostly extracted from marigolds. Correct. Yeah. So it's a flower. I guess marigolds are technically edible, but I don't think they taste very good. So yeah, I've never tried it, and I, I don't recommend my patients to go out and eat marigolds. But um, <laughs> the from from what I understand and reading the research on lutein, um, it's it's showing more support. It's not just good for the eye, but also for the for the brain. So mm -hmm. again, very similar to DHA. Maybe they're 
Yeah. Maybe partners, uh, partners antioxidants, they act like antioxidants in the body. And, you know, even the omega-3 DHA and EPA act like antioxidants in many ways. They help to mm -hmm. resolve inflammation. They stimulate these things called resolvins and protectins, resolvins, which resolve inflammation and protectins, which protect against DNA damage. So, you know, both of those things are pretty important. And that's one of the reason getting enough omega-3s every day is so critical. Well, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story and for coming on the show. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I hope you have too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, I really greatly appreciate it. And uh, I wish you the best for all that you guys are doing. Would you like to leave our audience with any specific thought? Um, just eat healthy, <laughs> get good sleep. Um, and if you, uh, whether or not you're having eye issues, definitely see your doctor, <laughs> see a local yeah. eye doctor, uh, and, and just get things checked out, make sure everything's working okay. And that you can do the best to prevent, uh, future eye disease. Cause I want you to see good today and on until tomorrow. Right on. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. To find out more about Dr. Joseph Allen, visit his social media pages and YouTube channel at Dr. Eye Health. That's at D-O-C-T-O-R Eye Health. I'll be sure to include direct links with show notes, including that video where he tested his before and after supplementation regimen and shared his results and his journey. Of key importance through this conversation is one resounding theme. It's a good idea to take your omega-3s and to remember to take them every single day. Now, I encourage you to visit orlonutrition.com and visit that Tested By You page. While our podcast and the blog associated with this is always published on orlonutrition.com under a podcast section, you can just navigate over to products, click on the Tested By You and subscribe. Get the everyday great price of 15% off in addition to receiving two free Omega Quant test kits, the same kits that Dr. Allen used in his own assessment. Now, that's a $100 value. We also can sell this, the kits directly on our site if you're interested in just checking where your levels are right now. But you get two free with a six-month subscription, and you can ensure that you're going to take that every single day to get the best results. You'll get to see what your baseline is, hopefully north of 4%, but don't be too alarmed if that's where you are, because after four months of sup supplementation, you're going to see a dramatic increase in that level. Remember to use the coupon code NWC at checkout for a bonus discount. Now, if you learned something today, I hope that you'll subscribe to this show, Nutrition Without Compromise, on your favorite podcasting platform. While you're at it, please give us a thumbs up, five-star review, and a written review. This will help us reach more people so they can achieve their best health naturally. Remember, again, go to orloadnutrition.com and use that coupon code NWC at checkout if you want to go ahead and take advantage of the Tested by You campaign. As we close today's show, I hope you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me as I say my closing words. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either or.